All right, audio enthusiasts, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're at. Today, I've got a really exciting video for you that has been two years in the making with this car, and it's sort of been like 20 years in the making with C4 Corvettes overall. Uh, what I'm gonna do today is, I'm not gonna specifically cover an individual project. I'm gonna go through what it took me to take this car from a 54,000 mile barn find that had sat for 12 years and did not run at all and was leaking oil, was leaking coolant from multiple places. Uh, this car was pretty much a mess. Uh, I'm going to go through today what it took me to take this car from barn find to daily driver because today it's a whole different animal than it was two years ago. Get a cup of coffee, get something to drink, maybe a little scotch, whatever makes you happy. Uh, we'll be back in a minute and we'll go through what it took. Now this car is really something special. Hey, wait a second. Changed colors. I'm just kidding around. This is a different car. Both of these cars are 85 Corvettes, but this car is really something special. This is an 85 Corvette that has 8,500 miles on it. Uh, like the silver car, uh, it is Doug Nash 4 plus 3. It is, uh, it is not a Z51 car, although it does have nine and a half inch wheels on it, which I still haven't gotten to the bottom of. I'm thinking at some point they were put on there. But uh, this car is a truly incredible car that I just could not pass up on. Uh, I run a group called the 85 Corvette Group that, start, that I started when I bought the silver car in, uh, last year. Uh, in the spring, which I, which I purchased as a, as a project car. It was a rolling project to fix it, had a lot of problems. This year in the spring, one of my members uh, messaged me and said, hey, there's a red 85 Corvette four speed, I think near you, that's for sale and you gotta check it out. And sure enough, here the car was. Now, when I was a kid, I thought C4 Corvettes were like the coolest thing ever. You gotta remember, cars looked like this at that time. And to me, the C4 was like a spaceship. And my uncle had a sports car book and there was a red C4 in there. It was probably an 84, but this is an 85. It's, appearance is exactly the same. Only real big difference is the engine. Um, and this car, I just, I mean, to me, it was like a spaceship. Uh, it, it was incredible. It was like, Someday you might have a Z28, but the Corvette was just like, it was like unattainable. Uh, I had the opportunity uh, to pick this car up and I just couldn't pass up on it. In the meantime, my, my wife really liked the silver car, but she wanted a red one. And she wasn't thrilled exactly with how the Z51 rides. Um, and so the silver car, which was my goal from the beginning to be the daily driver, and the red car was kind of like the show and the date night car. Now this car has an interesting story though. Like the silver car, this car had about 200 miles put on it in 15 years. 200 miles in 15 years. It mostly sat in a garage on a lift above another car. And then over time it became problematic getting the other car out and this car just sat and sat and sat and sat and sat. And so this car is going to need a lot of things. It's going to need differential fluid. It's going to need transmission fluid. It's going to need overdrive, uh, Doug Nash four plus three automatic fluid in it. Uh, it's going to, the brake fluid is going to have to be completely flush. The clutch fluid is going to have to be completely flush. So this car is going to need a lot of things, but it was kind of the perfect setup because this was the car I seen when I was a kid. This was kind of the car that my wife preferred. And I had just done 90% of that stuff with the silver car. 
So this video is not actually about this car. We'll get back to this one at the end of the video. This video is actually about this. Now I decided to take a little bit of a different approach with this car. Uh, with cars in the past, I try to keep all the service records, all the maintenance records, try to keep all the receipts and stuff. There's kind of a pain. You wind up with a big folder full of receipts. It's hard to track and all that kind of stuff. So the approach that I took with this car was I would take notes in my phone on what the car needed and then I would take note alongside of it what parts I was going to need and how much they cost. And then I would take note on, you know, which tools I was going to need to get that job done if I didn't already have them if it, or if it wasn't obvious. Then I would work on the car and then once it was complete, I would take the little dash away from the beginning of that item. And then I would enter all that stuff onto a spreadsheet. Um, just a really simple spreadsheet of uh, what the item was, when I did it, how much it costs. Um, some of the items I had done by a shop, I, I wrote down how much the labor was just to give me an idea and kind of drive home the point to me. Like I can fix these items, I, I, you know, with enough time and enough effort. But what is it going to cost me to get them done? And what I found pretty quickly was that it was you were better off doing the research and getting the car in the garage and doing it yourself. Because if you're going to have everything done, you know, it's going to get expensive. Now, if you're buying a car that's been driven every year and has been maintained, if you're not going to have to go through this like I did. But I was actually seeking a car that needed work because that's what I wanted. And you probably think I have a screw loose. I had an 89 Z51 that was in mint condition. And again, I wanted a daily driver. The car only had 25,000 miles on it. And it just didn't seem like the right thing to do to start racking up miles on a 40 year old car, well, 30 year old car um, that only had 25,000 miles on it. And I also wanted to learn and I wanted to do some of this work and see how it was. Um, I've done individual projects before, but I've never taken on a car that really needed a bunch of stuff. So, and I know, again, it probably sounds like I'm crazy, but I, I really wanted silver. Uh, the other car was like a, a magnetic, uh, I believe it was magnetic, it was charcoal or something. It was, it, was, it was almost like black. And I wanted a silver car, and I'm just funny like that. I really, I really like silver. Um, and again, I think for a daily driver, silver is the best color because it gets dirty and you can barely tell. And... So I wanted a silver car and I wanted one that needed a bunch of work and it had to be manual shift. Uh, I figured I could get the car for a good price and then I could fix stuff as I went. So I created this list here and I, I acquired this car. Now this car only had 54,000 miles, but had literally sat and not been driven for 12 years. And the previous owner, great guy, super honest, very honest with me, told me, the car's leaking oil. The car is leaking uh, coolant. He said, out of more than one location, I'm just done with it. And the value of the car, when you looked it up, uh, handling package, manual shift, air conditioning, was like $17,000 at the time. And um, again, the guy being very reasonable, knowing the car needed a lot of work, uh, I wound up getting the car for $10,000, which almost might have actually been a little bit more, I, you know, it's probably a little more than I should have paid because the car did need so much, but it had the silver paint that I really wanted. It was four speed. It only had 54,000 miles. It was a Z51. It was everything I wanted and the price wasn't that bad. So I bought it. Now let's just dive into this list a little bit. So the first thing, the car only came with one set of keys. I, I don't want to go crazy with this, but you don't want to find yourself without keys. It's expensive. Keys for this car are really simple. They don't have a chip or anything else. For whatever reason, my local hardware store, they, they couldn't copy the keys. So I, I went on eBay. I acquired the GM keys. They're cheap. I think I paid like six bucks a piece. I ordered two sets. The keys that I had for the car were worn. Like any day they might not work. All right. Don't find yourself without keys. It's not cheap. It'll take your time. It'll take your money. I think for $20, I got two sets of keys for this car. I took them to a locksmith. They cut them with no problem. So if you get a car and you only have one set of keys, don't mess around with that. Now, I, it's funny that because I just read a post recently, someone on a totally different vehicle and actually an SUV was saying that 
they've been nursing the vehicle along forever and they lost their keys and it was the final straw. Now that key had a chip in it. The dealership wanted $1,200 to replace the keys, all right? So get good keys for your cars. Have two sets made, have a brand new set waiting and have the set you have decent. So I got the new keys. The other thing was on this car, the driver door does not open with the lot with the with the key in the door and when i had it apart doing the weather strip i found that the pieces in there were not connected and i spent a half hour there was probably four letter words trying to get those two pieces reconnected and i just couldn't do it i lost my patience i was losing daylight i didn't have the garage then and i just gave up on it and i closed the door up and i wound up having the keyless uh, the remote keys put in. Um, I went to uh, my local uh, audio installer and I got these and I absolutely love this. I mean, keyless entry on the car is great. Um, like 90% of these cars had electric locks. So uh, I think they charged me $175 to put this in. Lock, unlock, uh, you hit the button and uh, the accessory button in the rear hatch pops. This is priceless. I mean, I usually have a gym bag with me in a backpack. I pop the rear glass, throw the stuff inside. Again, my goal was turn it into a daily driver. And if you're doing a daily driver, 85s don't have remotes, but they do have electric locks. And I highly recommend getting this added to the car. Uh, the rear view mirror was shaking when I got the car. That was super easy. I mean, I just loosened the, uh, took the screw out and I put some Loctite on it and tightened it up and boom, the rear view mirror was tight again. Nothing magical going on there. The emblems were all faded and stuff. The paint was in decent condition. I cleaned it. I, I washed the car. I put a coat of wax on it. It looked great, but the emblems looked terrible. You know, and our phones are like, you know, they're listening to you because it was weird. Like two days later uh, on, on Facebook, it pops up like, oh, eight, uh, Cor C4 Corvette emblems. And so I wound up, yeah, whatever. They're a good price. I picked them up, gave the car a little bit of a facelift. Uh, and then I wound up changing the engine oil uh, and the filter. Uh, of course, you're going to do that when you get the car. Transmission fluid filter. Now, this car uh, has the Doug Nash 4 Plus 3. Now, those cars, uh, they have, a, it's a four-speed, it takes gear oil, and then it has an overdrive unit on the back, which is actually just like a two-speed transmission. And when it's not engaged, you're just using the one speed. And then when you engage it, it kicks it into the second speed, okay? And, and just a little note, I didn't know this until recently, but overdrive just means that the gear ratio is above 1.0 so all four gears are below 1.0 it's not until you put it in overdrive that the tail shaft is spinning faster than the input shaft that's considered overdrive and that's why the six speeds overdrive is just the sixth gear because it's moving faster at the tail than it is at the input shaft just a little thing i learned recently uh, I gave the vehicle a coolant flush, nothing epic going on there. I didn't go the full distance and drain the whole system. I drained the radiator out, uh, I replaced the coolant, and then I tested it with the tester. Uh, it was still only at like negative 10. I drained all the coolant out of the radiator again. I put a new batch in, I ran it a little bit, and now it's at like negative 40. So that was good to go there. Um, I, 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 I took a chance and I just got the AC charge cost me a hundred bucks. I brought it over there over to a local shop, ice cold air. So it was, was well worth it. I got that done. Uh, and then it was like, you know, we started to drive the car a little bit. <laughs> now, again, I, I didn't have the car for long, started to drive the car a, a little bit. And the first night we take it out on date night, everything seems to be okay. We get the car home and we pull up to the house and we're going to get out. She goes to put her window up. The window gets about halfway up and it's tick, 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 tick. Okay. And so that symptom and that, uh, that, um, presentation is telling you that that's the old style window regulator, the window regulator, I believe they changed it in 88, the early from 84 to 87 were this ribbon style. So if your window gets like halfway up and it starts doing the tick, 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 you got the old style regulator and, uh, you know, the, the ribbon has, has broken. They're plastic ribbons. Uh, so I hadn't dealt with that and I hadn't ripped the door apart and I was just in like a rip where I was working like eight days in a row. So I just, 
I, I stopped at the shop that did the AC charge and I said, hey, you know, can you guys fix this? The guy said, sure, no problem. Order the part. We'll put it in. So the window motor wound up kept costing me $275. And then them putting it in turned out to be more of a project than they expected. Uh, I think they've done later cars, which had the later style and replaced them with the later style. This is the early ribbon style and required replacement, a little bit of modification. You have to drill another hole and everything. They wound up charging me $225 to install that. So I paid $500 to get the window motor fixed on the car, um, you know, by having an, a shop do it. So, you know, and that's the kind of thing. Now I could have just paid, and I, and I was also replacing the regulator. Now this car with 60,000 miles on it was probably the thing to do. The, the motor was moving a little slow. The other car, the red car, sure enough, about the third time that we took that car, just to a short little drive, the regulator broke, but the windows still move fast in that car. That car only has 8,500 miles on it. And one of the upcoming videos, I'm going to be ripping that door all apart, and I'm actually going to replace the ribbon on that car. But this car, I had a new regulator put in. I had them do it. The labor cost me $225. Um, so then the car, uh, that was the first time we took the car out. So the next time I said, no more date night. Uh, let's go smaller. We took the car out for ice cream. So we drove the car about 15, 20 minutes. We get there, we have ice cream, everything seemed to be fine. We come out and there's a big puddle of coolant on the ground. And I'll clip in a little video here. It was leaking out of the top left side of the intake manifold. There's a passage there. And when the car was hot, it, it, it would just, the pressure would build up and it would leak from that spot. Now, my first thought was to rip the top and everything off. And I went and I talked to the mechanic and the guy said to me, hey, listen, before we do all that, take the thermostat housing off because that's right about where the leaks were and torque those bolts to spec and that might stop the leak now obviously this might not forever be a forever fix but sure enough i i took the thermostat housing off i torqued those bolts to spec and the leak stopped so another perfect example of sometimes you can kind of curb yourself these costs and if you have a mechanic that's willing to maybe try an alter alternative method or if you're willing to kind of play with things in your garage, you might be able to, to fix some of this stuff your help, yourself. Uh, the hood release cable, it tended to stuck, stick. Now, keep in mind with these cars, I, I was doing this because, you know, you're used to every other car in the world. You pull the hood release, it doesn't come up. What do you do? You tap on the hood. Don't tap on the hood of a C4. It's not going to help the hood come up. What you want to do is put your fingers under it like this and just take your fingers and pull up like this. Basically, you put your hand underneath like this, pull the release, and just pull your fingers up and the hood will pop up. Now, uh, there is actually a product just combing through products that are available for C4s. A high temperature heat, the AC Delco made a high temperature grease that I put on there. And after I put that stuff on, this hood would pop it still doesn't pop on its own, but when I pull the release and I, I can just put two fingers underneath and just hit it and, and it comes right up. Um, I replaced the hood pop springs. It still doesn't pop. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know, maybe I didn't adjust it right, but what I know is when I pull the release handle, you can just put two fingers under there and pop it up. There's also a mod where you can add a cable in there, like as an emergency release. It's a fairly simple mod. There's a lot of videos on it. You can look it up. Uh, if you got a car with more miles or where your cables might be worn out, you might want to put the mod in there just in case you ever need it. Uh, so then the hood shocks. <laughs> Again, it's funny. I had a 93 and then an 89, and then I had this 85. This was my third C4. And I'm like, man, the, these older cars, the hoods were so much heavier. Uh, yeah, because the hood shocks aren't working. But just so that you know, the hood shocks also changed over time. In 84, when the car came out up to, I believe, 87, it was two little struts up in the front. And then they added, and there was a, a prop stick on the right side. And then they changed it where the props on the left side, which kind of makes more sense because the driver's over here. And that became the shock. And I believe for a year or two, they had that as the uh, opening shock and they had the two up front. And then on the later cars, it was just this piece here, which is the shock, which opens the hood. 
But as far as this car goes, uh, those items, I, I, I think I paid $24 for both of them. Um, getting them off, you can take them off very easy. You just pull two pins out and the old ones will come right off. And when I got them out, they were doing nothing. They just opened and closed. It took no effort. Those hood shocks were doing absolutely nothing. The replacements, you could barely push in, and you couldn't get them on there with the hood prop connected. So all you really need to do is get a second person, preferably have them gloves on so they're not marking up your hood with a ring or whatever, and disconnect the two 10-millimeter bolts because everything is a 10-millimeter bolt. Have them hold the hood, put the new shocks on, reconnect the two 10 millimeter bolts, look for the spot where this thing was and reconnect it. Um, it was a simple job. It took 10, 15 minutes and now the hood opens with two fingers. Like it just comes right up. You can stop three quarters of the way up. The hood will hold itself. It's like 24 bucks. It's definitely something that you want to do. Um, another thing with these cars, as much as I love C4 Corvettes, there is a thing I'm telling you. The air comes around this hood and it goes right behind the mirror and hits you right in the face, which is particularly fun if it's raining outside and you have the window down a little bit. It's like you're in the shower and it's just spraying you in the face. So they make these little air deflectors that go on the rear view mirrors and boy, I'll tell you, it solves the problem. The wind will just blow right over. The rain will just blow right over. You still have the window down a little bit if you want and you're not going to get the shower nozzle in the face. Uh, it's a really good mod that you, you definitely want to do. I highly recommend it. So I was going to change the spark plugs, okay? And this kind of came down to a package deal. If I'm going to be taking the plugs out, then why don't I get a couple other things done as well? What else can I tack on there? So I went ahead and I was like, hey, let's let's get a boroscope if one's, you know, if they're, if they're cheap. Um, and let's get a compression test done while we're in there. And so I did the spark plugs, the compression test, and the boroscope all at once like a package deal. And it took me like two hours and uh, it worked out well. Just keep in mind on 1985 there was a recall and the spark plug gap is different. Trying to get an idea of what condition this engine was in before I dove too far into the car with money, I, I could buy a boroscope for $35. So why not? I mean, they're available. They were kind of cheap. I didn't have a lot of faith in it, but I figured, hey, for 35 bucks, if I can get a look inside the engine. And sure enough, I got to tell you, that little boroscope worked great. Um, I was able to look inside these cylinders and see a lot of the things that I hope to see. The cylinders themselves have cross hatching. They go this way and it goes this way. And you can, when a car has been overheated and ran hard, a lot of time that cross hatching will be worn right out and it will just be worn smooth. When I looked inside these cylinders, I could still see the cross hatching on the cylinder wall, which to me was a, a good thing. Tells me that the engine wasn't excessively driven, overheated. Um, for 35 bucks, if you're you're gonna do spark plugs when you you know get the car, you're gonna do spark plugs at some point. Pick up a boroscope for and, and take a look inside. And, and I it was pretty neat. I but I was really I was in there doing spark plugs and I was also compression testing. It's super easy doing the compression testing. Um, was doing the spark plugs. One trick I had never done before with spark plugs is just take a piece of hose, about a six inch piece of hose, and you break the spark plugs loose. That's all the torque there is. Once they get broken loose, they should come out with fingers. But you're in there getting your fingers dirty, trying to twist these hot spark plugs. You know, it, it's not fun. Just take that little piece of hose and stick it over the spark plug and spin it right out. It, it just makes the job faster. It makes it easier and you stay cleaner, which kind of allows you to move you through the job more quickly. Um, and there's an adapter that I needed for my compression tester. I put that adapter right on the hose and reached in. And the one thing I'll tell you is just pay attention when you're screwing the adapter in or the spark plugs in. Those spark plugs should go in and should screw in three, four, five, six full turns easily. If you feel resistance, something's wrong and you don't want to cross thread a spark plug definitely not the way to go uh, i want to take a little break from the maintenance stuff that i did to the car and let's take a look inside the interior let's take a look at some of 
uh, the things getting into the car that a C4 owner or operator should definitely be aware of. All right, so the first thing that we see when, before we even get in the car, uh, we find in the door jam is a tag that tells us the date of manufacture of the vehicle, which right here says 1184, which is interesting because this car is a late 85. We know that it's a late 85 and there was a division in the year for the manual shifts. Early in the year, like the red car, has the overdrive button on the console. Later in the year, it has it uh, on the top of the shifter, which I, I actually think is pretty cool. So this was probably one of the earlier cars to get the manual shift button on top of the console because it was actually made in uh, November of 84. So probably one of the first cars to get that. So we've got our information tag here with the creation date. Pulled the car outside a little easier to see. Uh, you've got a hatch here which opens up the rear glass. You also have a hatch on the other side. Um, one thing that you should definitely be aware of is your e-brake handle, which is right here, okay? The e-brake is on so it's gonna free up and then pull it to release tension and then put it down. And now the e-brake is off, okay? This thing, uh, has given people trouble and one thing that I highly recommend that you do is Make sure that your e-brake button here Works, okay on your driver information center because this would be a very easy e-brake Like that's engaged right now, but it's down and I've heard stories about these cars being driven now Once you know the car you're not going to drive it with the e-brake on but when you're new to the car uh, it would be possible. So make sure that your bulb works on your driver information center. If it does not work, it's very easy change. You just take these four screws out. You can move this piece out a little bit. This cover comes off and this is a very easy change. Okay, so that takes us through the door. We come over here. This is our switch which flips our headlights up, which they call pop-up headlights and I'll never understand why. They, they don't pop up, they roll over. So 99% of cars, the pop-up headlights, well, they pop up. This car, they actually roll, I believe it's 270 degrees all the way over, and they offer uh, a more aerodynamic surface, although it does make the car look a little bit like a frog, but uh, we're getting off track. Uh, you know, they are one of the neater features of the C4 that I really like, so I put those down here. Now, you can put your driving lights on and not your headlights and then this switch here is for your fog lights and then when you put your directional on there's also lights out there to light up that area okay and that brings us to our driver center and this is the infamous uh the famous uh you know digital dash and now, uh, I don't, a lot of people don't know this. Uh, I think over time this information has been lost, but the designers of this car took a lot of cues from jet fighters. And what you have going on here is you got your RP, you got your miles per hour on the left and your RPMs on the right, and those are always displayed like mandatory information uh, and your fuel right here, just like in a jet fighter. But then you've got these four pods, okay? those four pods right there which are fully controllable by this side set of switches over here okay and so I've got all of it off right now now if you were performance driving you might want to keep an eye on, on your oil temp and you might want to keep an eye on your coolant temp um, and then you're probably not really uh, concerned with your gas mileage now if you're not performance driving and you're taking the car on a touring type drive then you might want to keep an eye on your trip odometer and maybe your average fuel economy. Pay no attention to that. I just reconnected the battery about 10 minutes ago. Um, or your instant fuel mileage. Okay, so this is made to mock like aircraft aviation, which is very similar to this. You would have a control panel on the side where you selected your information, and then it would appear on your central display if you were in uh, an aircraft. And so that's what this is all about. Now, obviously, this is not a computerized display. What they've done is created these four pods with just these on and off switches, but 
it's pretty neat. It, it's a lot more like a jet fighter than any other car, and I think that it's really neat. That takes us over here to our driver information center, and you can see a host of lights there. Uh, if I pop this door open, we should see a light pop on there. Or, I'm sorry, not the door, but rather the rear hatch. And there you go, you got your rear hatch ajar light pops on there. Your check engine light is in there. And speaking of check engine light, um, I want to point out that when the car is not running and you put the car for the forward position, your check engine light should come on, okay? So if you put your key to the forward position and the check engine light does not come on, that tells you that somebody has either removed that bulb or that bulb is blown out, which, um, you know, if you're trying to keep the car all original, which, you know, that's been my approach. I'm not looking to make this thing a rocket ship. I want a car that runs when I come out and I turn the key and your check engine light should come on in the forward position. And then when you start the car, it should go out uh, as, it, as it just did there. And that takes us over to what they call the bread box. And this is just another example. Government regulation in the early 80s when these cars came out was more oppressive than ever. And manufacturers are just struggling to keep up with uh, the emissions regulations and the gas mileage requirements. And one of the things that GM thought was gonna come out was an airbag mandate. And this was supposed to hold a man an airbag. It, that regulation did not wind up coming to be, and this has uh, just air. It's supposed to be airbag, and inside is just air. And so this is known by uh, the aficionados as the bread box, which I was going to delete. There's a panel that you put there, and I thought maybe we could put a screen on it or something cool, but my wife likes the bread box, and Mama's willing to ride in the car with me, so... You know I gotta give her I gotta give her you know what she wants it's it's her side of the car she likes the bread box so it's there to stay uh, and speaking of government regulations we come back here here's another cool little fact about this car uh, it, at this time period 1985 speedometers are limited to 85 miles an hour but you look down there and your digital is giving you three digits so they kind of snuck in a little extra speedometer down there um, now we'll take a look here this radio I learned a lesson here um, in early cars you did not have a system controller okay the way that the amplifiers and the speakers are set up is you feed them a full radio signal you know a, a speaker level input so you can put an aftermarket radio in the car and just feed the speaker outputs to the speaker input and use the factory amps. And that's how this car is set up. Now, I bought this equalizer because, I'm gonna be honest with you, I thought it would be cool, but not realizing that this is preamp, and so we weren't able to use the equalizer. But we put it in, we light it up, and it bounces around. I still think it looks neat. Um, I like having, I mean, I'm a big music guy. I, I had to have the Bluetooth. You know, you gotta be able to listen to your tunes. You know, when you're cruising down the road and you just got to hear Bob Seger and I don't know, maybe the CD doesn't work. Boom. There you go. That's your that's your number. Uh, unfortunately, 1985 automated heat and air conditioning was not a thing. And so these are manual controls. And that brings us to one of my favorite features in the car. And that is this Doug Nash 4 plus 3. Now, I had a 93 and an 89 with the ZF 6 speed. And I will tell you that... If I was auto crossing the car, I would want a ZF. Um, they are smoother, they operate, uh, they're more user friendly. I would want the ZF. And I would say at the end of the day, the ZF is probably the better transmission with the exception being if you're like drag racing and you're putting so much stress on the transmission that it needs to be rebuilt. This is a very rebuildable transmission. The ZF, um, I've been told, is not rebuildable friendly. Um, but that's kind of out of my wheelhouse. Those are just things that I've heard. Um, back to this car. I love the 4 Plus 3. It's basically a four-speed, the same four-speed that came in the car in 1976. 
um, except with that government regulation, as we talk about, there's that theme coming back again, that needed to get a certain amount of miles per gallon. I believe it was 23 miles per gallon. I'm not 100% sure. Um, and so they gave, it's a four speed manual, but you push this button here on top of the shifter because it's a late 85 and boom, just like that, you engage the overdrive. Now, because I've clicked this button, the overdrive would be engaged right now, but it will not kick in until 10 miles an hour and second gear, right? The overdrive will not kick in in first gear. Now, most of us that are driving these cars just use it like a fifth gear, and we push the clutch in and engage it just to kind of save it a little bit of stress, but you don't have to. You can be in fourth gear and just hit the button and it will engage. Now this was a learning lesson for me about the light. Um, when it you engage it 10 miles an hour and above on second, third or fourth gear, it adds that tail shaft second gear. Um, the light pops on up here that says overdrive engaged, okay? That light overdrive engaged only exists on 84 and 85 Corvettes. In 1986, they standardized the symbols and it became a D with the line around it, like all overdrives and all cars. So kind of neat. Um, so basically only late 85s have the push button on top and the overdrive engage buttons. And again, because this car was four, this was probably one of the first cars to be set up that way with the button on top and the overdrive engaged right here. Just kind of neat information about these cars and just a little bit of a reflection of how fast they were evolving uh, and, the, and the government regulation was influencing the cars. Um, to take a quick step back to the performance of this transmission, um, I'm gonna be honest, the four speed is a little bit clunky. I believe that because you have an H pattern and there's only four gears, the divider between first and third is a little wider than it would be on a six speed. So like if you're in second and you try to rapidly go to third and like take the diagonal, you hit the divider, <laughs> right? The other thing is like if you're in first gear, and you go to pull it into second and you put lateral pressure on it, it will hang up like in the middle, right? So I tend to think of it like a slotted shifter, even though it's not a slotted shifter. You want it to really be in the H pattern. And then like when you get to the middle, you can't just push it forward. You have to push it right and up. Um, I think it's a ton of fun. I love the transmission and I think for a driver car, the Doug Nash is a great transmission. It's a ton of fun. It can be a little difficult to dance with, um, but with some effort, uh, it, it is a neat transmission. That only came again on the 84 to 88 Corvettes. Uh, in 89, they went to the ZF six speed. Uh, the other thing about the transmission is this collar has to be pulled up to go into reverse, which I think is kind of neat. And again, there's the pattern. You pull to the left and up, okay? And one of the importances there is with the six speed, you go to the right and up. And so a lot of people will say, well, these are the most useless cup holders in the world. Well, if you have a six speed, they do tend to be rather useless, my 93 and my 89, because to go into fifth or sixth gear, you'd just be wiping your cups out. No questions asked. Now, these are also kind of shallow. Um, and I will say that if you have a cup that's smaller than this opening, it's gonna, it's gonna spill. If you have a cup that's larger, it's not gonna fit in. But there's a lot of cups to, like, we, we take it out and, you know, my wife had like a, I don't know, mocha latte chate, some fancy thing over here. It was like this tall. And we were driving back roads with this thing and it did not tip over, um, some dragon fruit thing. I don't know. Um, you know, and I had a medium coffee over here and we use the cup holders all day long, but again, it's that original design with the Doug Nash four plus three, not the ZF six speed reverse is on the opposite side. So just a little bit of information there. Of course, it's got a, uh, it's got a cigarette lighter there. Uh, you've got your window controllers in the center. These quickly grow on you. It's like, we'll take this car on a road trip and then my wife will come home and say, I reach for the console to do the window for a week. It's like, 
Th these are actually really neat. This little switch right here switches the, the window control, which I, I keep this little plate. These are available. There's just aftermarket covers for this little change area here. And then this controls the windows back and forth. This controls the seats, uh, which um, these are not sport seats, okay? If they were sport seats, they would have a controller right here. And on this side, you have air, which is kind of cool. You inflate the backing of the seat, the lumbar support. And then there's three pins, which can deflate that lumbar supports individually, which is kind of cool. I mean, this is kind of neat. I, I never really thought it was that big a deal though. But on this side of the seat is where all the fun is. On the sport seats, you hit a button and the bolsters on the seat actually move in and out. And that is super cool. Um, you know, my wife always says it's like when you hit that bolster button, it's almost like the seat's like, hey, you want to be friends? Yeah, I want to be friends. Uh, so you hit the button and it's like this thing turns into a race car seat. It really holds you, uh, which is cool and brings me to another point, which is this seatbelt. Okay, these are the coolest seatbelt, very easily overlooked. You'll notice that this buckle does not slide on this belt, okay? This is basically a two-point harness. And when you plug it in and you just want to use the seatbelt normally, it's fine. It's comfortable. It just operates like a normal car. But make no mistake, this is no normal seatbelt. Over on this side, you have a clinch button. And you can hit the clinch button. And once you hit that clinch button, it locks that seatbelt. So this the seat gives you the ability to be comfortable with your bolsters out and have your seatbelt flowing free and go, you know, out to dinner and it's a comfortable car or push the clinch button, lock the seatbelt, push the button, pull the bolsters in and it makes the car feel like a race car. Now, I, I have to say, there's definitely an argument to be made that this is the most jet fighter feeling interior and it's I mean the the designers made no they, they they didn't hide it at all They tried to make this car feel like an airplane and I, I think it does um, I'm in the aviation business. I mean, I don't fly fighters, but uh, I do weight and balance calculations on cargo airplanes but uh, this thing I have sat in a jet fighter at an air show and this car, I feel like, feels more like driving an F-16 around than any other vehicle I've ever driven. Um, now, an item I'll just go through quickly. When I bought the car, the steering wheel was the original, and it, the 85 steering wheel is kind of thin. It was worn. Uh, it tended to kind of vibrate a little bit, especially around the turns. And I corrected that by doing two things. Number one, I replaced it with this thicker steering wheel, which I don't, it doesn't seem like much, but let me tell you, game changer. I love the steering wheel. It's very comfortable. Um, it was well worth the money. I think I paid like a hundred bucks for it. Um, I was getting the tires put on and I had the guy put the steering wheel. I think he charged me like 10 bucks. Or he might have put it on free. I have a great mechanic up the road that did the tires for me. Um, and it's always great to have a good mechanic or two or three to talk to. I mean, the guy's always willing to give me advice and help me with what I'm doing with the car. Um, I do most of the work myself, but I happen to have this steering. He put the steering wheel on for me and I absolutely love it. You know, you spend a lot of time with your hands on the steering wheel and this is a lot better than that thin kind of worn other one. The issue with the steering wheel kind of vibrating, I think was because the power steering fluid was just like as thin as water when power steering fluid is almost like honey when it comes out, it's thicker and it's like golden. And this power steering fluid in this car was like, it, it was like black water. And after I drained off the, I didn't do like a full fluid change. What I did was I drained everything out of the reservoir and I refilled it about five or six times and the steering wheel calmed down a lot and it felt a lot better, which took me to the next issue that I was having with the car. The steering wheel calmed down, it, it felt a lot better. Um, 
The only thing I want to, a couple other little things I want to cover in the interior. This has like a cargo cover, which is very nice. I like it. I leave it up 90% of the time. Sorry, I didn't have time to clean the car out. There's some stuff back here. Um, I did, my wife got me these wonderful floor mats uh, for my birthday. Um, I like them. They, they match the car very well. These brackets are to hold the acrylic top for the car. Now, the acrylic top is an option. My first two C4s did not have this acrylic top. Um, but I have to tell you, I absolutely love it. I'm not going to call it a game changer, but I love the acrylic top. And I find that I enjoy it even when it's in. Uh, it doesn't have to be out. Uh, all C4s are target tops. Their tops come off. But the car, the top that comes with the car is is uh, is not acrylic. It's uh, it's composite and it is painted body color. This is an additional option. This acrylic top. I'll I'll try to put up the build sheet and circle it. Um, and I absolutely love this top. Now, one thing to note about this top, and they all do this, is over time they develop these micro cracks. And because I didn't know a lot about these cars, when I went to look at this car, um, I seen these micro cracks and I was concerned that it had maybe possibly been in an accident. The car fax said no, the original owner, the owner I, I bought it from said that, you know, he was unaware of it ever being an accident. These little cracks are absolutely not indicative of the car having been in an accident. It's natural over time. And if you replace this top today, these little cracks would form in time. So if you're, if you're looking at a C4 and it's got some of these little cracks, that's perfectly normal. They all get that. Um, I love the top. I'll show you guys. It comes out. I, I recommend that you use two people because it just makes it a lot easier. This storage bracket in the back has a rubber gasket that goes around and it's just a lot easier with two people to to fit it in there the top comes out it spins 180 degrees and then you come back and then you just set it in the back and then it actually locks into that little tab in the back i'll, I'll show you that in a minute um and again for 1985 the car came with the bose sound system now i'm not running the bose radio that came with the car i do have the bose radio um, but I think this the sound system sounds phenomenal for what it is for being almost 40 years old um, You know and I and I grew up uh, in, in Involved in like the DJ business um, You know, I'm not gonna listen to a not great sound system and I think that this sound system in this car is on par with What comes in some of today's cars, which is pretty impressive so that's about it for the interior. I'll just give you guys a quick shot of what this top looks like in the storage bracket. The car comes with, should have come with this little wrench. And this wrench stores in the glove box and is for taking off the C4's target top. Um, it's a neat little wrench. You know, you can switch it for, you know, it's a little ratchet wrench. It also has these little hashes in the meaning. So once you bust the, the bolt loose, you can just spin them with your finger. The front bolts do not come out and the back bolts do. Now I'm gonna do this by myself, but again, like I said, it's a lot easier with two people. Take it out, spin it 180 degrees, set it in a little rack. Make sure that you get between the rubber pieces. This is the rubber piece right here. Make sure you get between them. And if your, your storage rack doesn't have these rubber pieces, they are available. All right, and then we come back here and there's that little button there and that slides right in. You can see how tight that is. That is not coming out of there. There is your acrylic top stored in your rear storage system. We're gonna leave it there. Uh, I replaced these shocks as well, very easy. The other ones are a little different. There's basically two types. There's a kind where there's a little pin right here and you can just take like a pick and hit the pin and it releases. And then there's this kind where there's a little clip right here which you just pop this clip off and it releases. Um, I've got the uh, window heater, so get the one that one there. And you do just have to pay attention to this and make sure that the window, this piece is up, not down. Because when you shut it, it will break this. 
Uh, and I, I'm glad, luckily I noticed it before because I had it upside down and I said, oh, that's not gonna work. So I replaced those. Those are cheap. They're pretty easy to replace. Well, and there it is. Uh, again, all C4s are target top. Um, it's not an option, but the acrylic top, the clear top is. Uh, another thing, you could delete these visors, which on my 89, the visors were not in it, even though the car was like super, super original, um, which I always thought was stupid because my 89 did not have the acrylic top. But with the acrylic top end, these visors are a little bit annoying. And if you have sunglasses and you're wearing sunglasses, then what do you need these for? Um, but again, my wife likes hers with the little light up mirror. So we're keeping them for now. So there it is, the 85 C4 Corvette with the target top out. Uh, this color is called medium gray metallic medium gray metallic and you know I wanted silver but the medium gray metallic has really grown on me the car is a little dirty right now it was in storage for a little while and then I had some work to do on my other car so it sat outside and it got dirty and it is the beginning of winter time here in New York this is an aftermarket exhaust system it's definitely louder than the original um, Let's get the car back in the garage and we'll go over the rest of what I needed to do to make this car reliable. So another thing I wanna mention is the RPO codes and they are back here under this panel. There's our RPO codes right there. This is gonna tell you all the build information about the vehicle and the there's a website that you can go to you just type in 1985 corvette production numbers you can go to the website and it will tell you what each of those codes means and and what percentage of cars came with those codes Uh, there's the color codes. There's two color codes because, you know, some cars were two-tone. This car's not two-tone, so both color codes are exactly the same. Uh, and those are related to, you know, this car has a belt line, which is this piece in the middle. And obviously the one color code is for the bottom. The other color code is for the top. This car's all one color, which is medium gray metallic, which is what that code was. And so the whole car is medium gray metallic. Now this car has the turbine wheels, okay? And these are called turbine wheels for several reasons. Reason number one, well, they kind of look like a turbine. Reason number two is these slots here, right? And I hear this is coming up on the forums all the time. This comes up so much with Corvettes. Your wheels are going the wrong way. Uh, we've all heard that before, that your wheels are going the wrong way. What does it mean that your wheels are going the wrong way? Well. There's two main things when they talk about the wheels going the wrong way. Uh, number one is that the style design of the wheel is with the spikes going forward, okay, near the top of the wheel and backwards towards the bottom, okay? And the second reason that this is called a turbine wheel is inside the wheel, the, the wheel has fins, which as the wheel turns, it draws in cool air to cool the brakes, okay? Now these turbine wheels ran 84, 85 with black centers. Then 86, they had silver centers. Uh, and then 87, they had ardent gray centers, okay? So the same wheel, but stylized a little bit different. And you had a base car wheel, which was eight and a half inch and then you had the z51 wheel which was nine and a half inch in 1984 only the back wheel was nine and a half inch for the z51 uh, and then in 88 you had the one year razor wheel on the base and you had the salad shooter with the center bolt cover which is arguably the best c4 wheel I, I, that is a really cool c4 wheel in 1989 they all got salad shooters with the center caps and then in 90 they had the salad shooter wheel 
uh, without the center cap where you could see the bolt. So there's one, you know, one less piece. Uh, it was good looking wheel too, but I kind of like the center caps. They were pretty neat. Uh, and then in 1991, they went to the saw blade wheel. Okay. And again, everyone tends to bunch all the saw weight blade wheels into one category, but they are most certainly are not. The original 91 saw blade had a painted cert, had a painted finish. Uh, and then I believe it would remain the same for 92 and 93 they went to a machine surface like this with clear coat on it and also the back wheel uh, was a 285 tire and the front was a 275 so uh, that creates issues with tire rotation um, and these wheels are very specific and getting them on the car the correct way um, uh, and the other item is that the manufacturer actually went out of the way to produce a left wheel and a right wheel and they're labeled inside so that these marks go that way. So like an example of a car that they didn't do that on was like say the 1993 Z28. All four wheels are the same. So on one side of the car, the fins go this way. On the other side of the car, the fins go the other way. But on C4 Corvettes, they actually made a left wheel labeled the left wheel and a right set of wheels labeled the right set of wheels. Uh so what you have to watch out for is some ultra high performance tires are directional and they have to go in one direction. So if when they put the wheels on the car, they put the tires on the wheels, if the wheels were backwards, then the tires are not going to be pointing in the right direction for their rotation if you switch them around on the car. When I took my car to, when I got these new tires put on the car, I had to, I brought, I had bought a piece of paper with the car and showed them like, look, these, there's left wheels and there's right wheels and you'll see the labeling inside and he did them correctly. Um, you know, and, and it's tough to not go into a, a place like that and, and, you know, tell, you know, make them feel like you're telling them how to do their job. and. You know, I just kind of went and said, hey, this car is a little bit different. You know, the, these wheels are a little bit different. There's lefts, there's rights. Um, now, when it comes to rotating them, I really can only rotate them the front to the back, uh, the back to the front, the front to the back. Because if I rotate them the other way around, then those turbine fins are going to be going the wrong way. And I'm going to be drawing hot air out, which is heating the rim up. And the secondary thing that's nice is, and I'll tell you, this is 100% real. Because it's drawing air in, when you hit the brakes and the car is going, uh, you know, say highway speed and that brake dust comes out, it's pushing the brake dust in, okay? So on this car, like I haven't cleaned these wheels in months and they still look decent. I mean, there's a little bit of brake dust on them, but not much, okay? I have a Camaro with uh, basically what were the ZR1 wheels for the Corvette, the five spoke wheels. and after a couple of hundred miles, the brake dust is piling up at the end of the points because there's you don't have that air movement like you do with these C4 turbine wheels, which is pretty cool. Um, and then like with the saw blade wheels, they still had that left and right thing because of the way uh, the design of the wheel. So another thing that you really want to look at on your wheels is your DOT code. And unfortunately, they're upside down on this wheel, but it is what it is. DOT and these last four numbers, 23, 22. This tells us that these wheels were manufactured on the 23rd week of 2022, okay? Generally speaking, manufacturer guidance is that these wheels will give us um, factory performance for five years, okay? And... I believe in it. You could do a whole video on this topic and talk about it forever, but it does depend on, you know, if the car is garaged, if the wheels are in the direct sun. Um, but when I purchased this car, it had Eagle GSCs on it, which I thought were super cool, but they stopped selling Eagle GSCs in like 2002. Okay. And in the fall, when the roads were cold, I was driving it in the rain and it got squirrely when I didn't think it should have. And I think it's because those tires were old. And in the spring, I, I had these new Cooper tires put on and these things have been awesome. I feel like they made the car ride a lot better. 
Um, unfortunately, 255 tires are like, uh, they're like extinct. Uh, and that's the factory size. So these are 245 50R16s. I compromised a little bit and I went with these because I wanted to keep the factory wheels. Um, but they have been awesome, you know, and when I loved them the most, I was driving it to the Corvette Museum. It was like two o'clock in the morning. I'm in Southern Kentucky. I mean, I was in the most unbelievable lightning storm and I come up on the highway on a C8 doing about 25 miles an hour, probably because, you know, with ultra high performance tires on it, he doesn't want to be all over the road. These things were awesome. They cut right through the water. I was doing like, 50, 55 miles an hour with no problem whatsoever. They were not wavering. And so, um, again, if you're doing the daily driver type of thing, uh, you really want tires that are within five years old. Uh, and you really want, like, this is great. This is an all season sport tire. And I'm super happy with these tires. All right, so we've gone through some of the stuff it took to get the car set up. Uh, we've gone through the interior. I want to go through some of the items on the list it took to take this car from barn find to uh, daily driver. <clears throat> so one of them was the shocks. The last thing we talked about in the interior was the steering wheel. And another issue with the car was that when you went around turns, it would lean a little bit, um, but it would get kind of squirrely in the turns. And on a straightaway, if you like on a, a certain kind of surface, the car would kind of like repeat the bump. Um, so I acquired the Bilstein Z51 shocks because this is a Z51 car and I think they made a world of difference. This thing really handled different after I put the Bilstein Z51 shocks on. Now with the other car, the red car, well, because the miles are so low, I would re probably replace them with Bilstein shocks as, uh, as well. But if I had a non-Z51 car um, with higher mileage, there's other shock options out there as well that probably do just as well. Um, the tires, we already talked about the tires uh, and the date codes. They're definitely something that you want to take a look at. Um, <clears throat> so I was driving the car. Um, you know, it was running a lot better. I, I had, had stopped the leaking of the uh, coolant uh, from the intake. Um, but another problem was the car was leaking oil from the valve covers. Now, I, I knew that right from the beginning I was going to have to do the valve covers. Uh, the thing that I didn't anticipate was 1985 was the first year for eight cylinder fuel injection. Uh, 1984 car had crossfire injection. There was one injector in the had in the throttle body and it had two throttle bodies this car's intake uses a common rail fuel injection system which is pretty awesome because they like literally ran that same rail until 2002 and probably beyond in some other cars so it's kind of neat that the system that they put in the 85 corvette ran and ran and ran and was hugely successful um, but I was having a little bit of a problem where I would turn the key forward and, and it would take a little bit of an effort. It would take a couple seconds before it kicked in. And so I did a little bit of research on it and fuel pump relay is what it leads to. Um, when you put your key to the forward position, your fuel pump relay should energize your fuel pump for two seconds and bang, your fuel pressure should come right up. Okay. Well, I put the key in and turn it to the forward position and it like, like it just came up like two PSI. So I'm like, seems like the fuel pump relay is bad. And so the fuel pump relay is located right on the firewall, right over here. If you have a manual transmission, then your manual transmission relay is right in front of it, right over here. And very, very easy replacement, two 10 millimeter bolts. Of course, everything is 10 millimeter bolts. Um, it took me maybe 15 minutes. I put it in there. Uh, connected my uh, fuel pressure tester and what a difference. I mean, you turn the key to the forward position and, and, and that's that clip that's in the intro. Bang! I mean, the pressure comes right up instantaneously, okay? And so I highly recommend if you have one of these cars, you definitely want to get a fuel pressure tester, okay? They, they don't cost much. It's got a pressure release button on it and then it's got a little tube that runs down, just stick it in a bottle or something. These cars have a Schrader valve right on the fuel rail. Take the cap off, 
screw on the fuel pressure uh, gauge and push the button to deplete the pressure down to nothing, get in the car, turn the key forward and bang, it should spike right up to 40 PS, right, right up to 40 PSI. If it doesn't do that, the fuel pressure regulator is bad. So then the next thing was I started the car up and when I hit the gas, the fuel pressure would first drop, right? It wouldn't, when you spike the throttle, the fuel pressure should increase, not decrease. So that told me that I either had some stuffed up filters or the fuel pump was bad on the car. Uh, so I replaced the filter, which is on the passenger side, uh, up underneath the fuel rail. Uh, not a big deal, you know, maybe a $10 filter. Uh, I hooked the fuel ga uh, pressure gauge back up and it did the exact same thing. So that means either the pump on, either the filter on the pump or the pump itself. Now the pump itself is like $60, $70 comes with a filter. Um, I had no history on the car. So I just said, Hey, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to change the fuel. Pump. The other thing is a fuel pump on a C4 Corvette is about the easiest fuel pump in the world to change. Okay. And what I would recommend is if your car, you know, your C4, your C4 is getting up there in age. It's somewhere between 30 and 40 years old. Um, clean out the gas tank. I noticed that when I took uh, the sending unit out, what was down, there was some debris down in the bottom of the gas tank. And what I think happened is that debris loosened up over time while I was driving the car and it clogged the filter and it clogged the pump. So I decided not, oh, actually first, I'm sorry, I threw a new fuel pump in it and I drove the car for a couple of days. It started doing the same thing all over again. And I took the fuel pump out and the filter was clogged again. So that's when I took a closer look at what was going on in the tank and it was dirty. Um, so I siphoned all the gas out of the tank as much as I could, got as much gas out of there. I threw some pig mat back there and I, I, I got the rest of the fuel out. I took some shop towels and I cleaned out the gas tank. Just reach your arm down in there and just clean it all out as best as you can. Those towels came out looking nasty. It was well worth it. I highly recommend that you clean out your gas tank because... Mine was nasty and the car doesn't even have a ton of miles on it. And I know that I have a feeling the previous owners took decent care of it. And that's how bad mine was. If yours has, you know, 75 plus thousand miles on it, it costs like 15 bucks for some pig mat and some shop towels. Clean out the gas tank. After I did that, I did take a shop back and stick it in there and just vacuum out the gas tank. I got the gas tank spotless. I put a new filter on that pump that I had replaced the week earlier. Uh, I put the sending unit and the stuff back together. I poured some gas in the tank and I have not had a problem with fuel since then. Uh, the car has ran great. Now, again, this was another forum thing. I brought up, hey, what do you guys like to do with fuel? Keep in mind in 1985 when these cars are met, this probably doesn't apply to the later cars. Um, that uh, what do you guys do for fuel? Ethanol didn't exist when this car hit the road, right? And so uh, ethanol free fuel is available near me. And this is like a weird topic where like near me, it's 89 octane. Other places, ethanol fuel that's available is 91 octane. Other places, ethanol fuel isn't even available. So I talked to a couple people on the forum. Uh, you know, we kind of sent some messages back and forth and several people all said the exact same thing. They run the car on ethanol free fuel and they put fuel injector clean at every other tank of fuel. And so I started doing that. And for this whole summer that I drove this car and I drove this car 98% of the time, I did not have any fuel issues after that. So I highly recommend that same thing. Put, um, put, uh, I like the Lucas. Um, there's other brands out there. I have run the other ones when I didn't have the Lucas, um, a tank, a, a bottle of fuel injector cleaner, every other tank and run the ethanol free fuel if you can get your hands on it. And this thing has purred like a kitten. Clean out your gas tank, it's, it's a cheap thing. Um, if you don't think you need a new fuel pump, then what I would recommend if you just got the car or you haven't had it for too long is just get a new filter for the fuel pump. You can buy it separately and just clean out your gas tank. Just get some pig mat and some shop towels and siphon out the gas and clean out the gas tank because it's going to wind up leaving you on the side of the road or giving you a headache and you're going to wind up cleaning out the gas tank sooner or later. And I distinctly remember about 15 years ago, um, bringing my Z28 into a shop that I used to know these guys real well. And there was a C4 Corvette there and I was like, oh, that's so cool. I always wanted one of those. 
Uh, actually, I had the 93 at the time, and but th- his was an older one. It was the older body style. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And and he was telling me how much problem they were having with the fuel system. And then about two weeks later, he told me, yeah, we wound up cleaning out the whole fuel tank. So just do it. It's cheap. It's not a lot of work. You take out nine, what size bolt you think, 10 millimeter bolts, the sending unit comes right out. Uh, you take out four T10 bits and, and the fuel door comes off. Take the cap off. You take this little rubber boot off and uh, nine 10 millimeter bolts. The fuel sending unit comes out. The hoses, I did use a hose disconnect uh, tool. There is a tool for that. And I'll tell you, it is actually handy. These these hoses are old and you don't want to be cranking on them, okay? So when you you loosen up the clamps. If, if you don't have worm clamps on there, I would recommend that you switch to worm clamps. There is a hose removal tool and you don't want to jack up these old fuel lines. I found that tool very useful. You stick it in there. There's a little ridge where the hose meets up and just pull the clamp and it will separate the hose off so you're not pulling on it and breaking it off or opening up a hole. The tool was like $8, I think, and it worked great. So uh, pick up a hose removal fuel, some pig mat, and a fuel filter at the very least, and some shop towels and clean out your fuel tank. Um, And while you're in there, if you don't know the history, throw a new fuel pump in it, Um, especially if you're getting anything funny indications from your fuel pressure uh, gauge. Uh, so another thing I ran into was the weather strips on the doors were all cracked up. The water was leaking down into the door, you know, and it was just it made the car look bad, which is sad because I mean, mo- mostly overall the car looked pretty good, but the weather strips were terrible. And I don't know why, but I had this like phobia of doing it because I had never done these, uh, these, uh, felt strips on the door. And I feel like they have 10 different names. You can look them up a hundred different ways. Let me tell you something. They were super easy to do. Okay. I got a rivet kit. I've never done rivets before. Taking the door panel off was super easy. You take off like eight screws in the bottom of the door. The one thing I will tell you is disconnect that latch release before you take the door panel off. All the connectors on the door are different. So it's not like you can put the wrong one in the wrong place. Okay. The door panel kind of lifts off and it comes off. You put the window all the way down and it exposes the two rivets. Now they are two different sizes, but it's not a big deal. I, just, I bought the kit. It was, it was like 30 bucks. I got the gun and I got all the different bits and it had the bits I needed. Um, the, the old weather strip that was in there pulled right off. I didn't even have to drill it out. I had a drill and drill bit ready to go. I, I didn't even need it. The old weather strip pulled right out. I put the new weather strip on. There's room in there with the window in the fold down position. I got the rivet in there, installed it. it the, the excess little piece popped off. It was super easy. Don't be intimidated by the weather strips. If yours are cracked up, buy another set and buy a rivet gun. And uh, they are not something that is a, a big deal to do at all. Um, I had a little bit of a shimmy up front on this side, um, and I found that the tie rod end was was moving very easily, okay? And so I replaced the tie rod ends. Um, I had had the shocks replaced. Uh, when I had the shocks replaced, I did the tie rod ends. They're pretty easy. Um, and then I had an alignment done on the car. Have an alignment done. You definitely want to have an alignment done. So then I had an issue with the car where I had like a wandering idle. Like it just, it wouldn't settle down. It was just kind of always wandering around. And I did a little research. And one of the things was idle air control valve. At this time, I didn't have the computer tool to plug in. I wasn't getting a check engine light anyways, which is weird. But the idle was wandering up and down. I couldn't get it to settle down. It was, you know, it was aggravating me. I wanted the car to run right. So one of the things that kept coming up is idle air control valve, idle air control valve. Okay. So, if so, I just bought another one. Um, the one thing I will tell you about the idle air control valve is that it's underneath the throttle body and it is super tight to the throttle body. You can't get a regular socket, excuse me, onto it. So you really have to buy a 32 millimeter thin wall socket to get the, uh, get the idle air control valve out. The other thing, which, you know, <laughs> I was trying to get the job done. You know, I, I just, sometimes I get impatient. I, I took a crescent, I, I took a, a combination wrench and I took a grinder tool and I grinded down the closed end of it. So it was thin enough to get in there. 
uh, and break it loose. Um, unfortunately, I didn't grind enough all the way around and I, I should have just got it loose, taken it out with my fingers. I hit the throttle body and it broke the idle air control valve. And so I wound up taking the throttle body off and uh, taking it to uh, a mechanic that I know that's been working on cars for a long time. And the guy just laughed at me and he cut it off with a, a set of clippers and he took this tool and put it in and this reverse and, and, and pulled out the piece of the, of the idle air control valve that was stuck in there. And, you know, and that was it. We screwed in the new one. So idle air control valve. After I put the new idle air control valve in, uh, the, the throttle stopped wandering. So that was cool. That was a pretty uh, easy fix. That's a pretty easy item. I think it's pretty typical, and, and I think you'll see that. Um, then, unfortunately, I ran into the next issue with the car. I, I love the overdrive feature, four-speed manual, and then I use it like a fifth gear. You get the fourth, push the clutch in, you hit the overdrive button on top of the shifter. I always like imagine that being a nitrous button. That would be super cool. I get one of those switches where you can switch it. So you can switch the function of that switch. So like I can use it as an overdrive switch or I can switch it and use it as a nitrous switch. Now it's probably crazy. But anyways, um, I was having problems with the overdrive unit. I would engage it, be driving down the road and it would come out and then it would go in. And, uh, and then 10 minutes later it would come out and it would go in. And then... The next day, I'd be driving it to work, it would come out and it would go in. It started getting worse and worse and worse. And I couldn't figure out what was going on. It was aggravating me. I did a second gear bypass. Um, that didn't really seem to fix the problem. Uh, I, you know, and, I, and that's when I got my hands on a scan tool. Okay. And, and you really, if you, if you can get your hands on one of these, if you're, if you're going to have one of these cars, you really should get one. Okay. And I was thinking, like, what good is a scan tool going to do me? Because I don't know what these parameters you know, all of these parameters should be. Well, let me tell you, the manual that comes with you tells you what you should be seeing. And so I hooked the scan tool up, never used an OBD1 scan tool in my life, hooked it up, got the manual out, followed the instructions. I think I had to put like the, the 11th vintage in, I think it was an A, I mean, I put it in and very easy, never done it before and started going through the parameters. And when I got to the temperature, it was indicating negative 40. And then the manual tells you that's like a default cold for bad engine coolant temperature sensor. Um, and again, you know, truth be told, I didn't know where the engine coolant temperature sensor was on this car. There's multiple, uh, there's one for the interior gauges, which is on the right side of the engine. Um, the one that was giving me a problem was up front under the throttle body, okay? so there is a possibility that I broke it when I was doing the idle air control valve. So all this work you really want to try to do as carefully as possible. I get in there and I start looking around and what I find is that the, and it's probably me, I probably broke it. Uh, the housing for the engine coolant temperature sensor had broken off and there was just two prongs sticking out. And I reached in there with these long pliers that I had and I grabbed it and I stuck it back on and I got in and the overdrive unit worked again like it was brand new. So uh, the thing is that the transmission will not engage the overdrive until the engine is over a temperature of 150 degrees. So if you have a problem with your engine temperature coolant sensor, your overdrive for your Doug Nash manual transmission won't work or it'll kick in and out. It'll do bizarre things. It's not cool. Um, I used my scan tool to find that my engine coolant temperature sensor was bad and, uh, you know, got in there and fixed, I want to say it was a 22 millimeter socket. I'm not hundred percent sure, but one of those sockets, um, I got a new engine coolant temperature sensor in it. Uh, wasn't a big deal. You do, if you have your, um, air, air, uh, pump still in the car, it helps to, uh, take this one bowl. I believe it's an 11 millimeter. Uh, under that bracket and it helps to have a pivot head ratchet wrench to reach under there and get that bolt off you move that bracket once you do that it's pretty easy to get at the uh the engine coolant temperature sensor that's under the throttle body and again it's like a 20 dollars sensor of course 20 dollars sensors that are 40 years old start going bad and that to me felt like a bit of a theme as i started driving this car more and more and more um, but it wasn't a big deal. You know, I figured out what it was and I got in there and I fixed it.
Uh, so then, you know, not a big issue, but it was like the heat or the air conditioning was like barely coming out. The blower motor was just, you know, it wasn't great. And so, um, you know, I, I started shopping around and this is where I'm going to mention it's great to form a relationship with a Corvette uh, you know, distributor or parts seller. Um, I've used top flight automotive. I've called them a couple of times. They've given me good advice. I'm not dogging anybody else. I like them because they're very close to me. And when I order stuff, it's in the mail, like two minutes after I order it. And it's at my house, like in a day or two, I don't even have time for the weekend to get here for me to fix the car. And the parts are already at my house. And so they've just been great to deal with. Um, I recommend you find someone close to you that deals with Corvettes, like those telltale bulbs that are in your driver information center. You can go to the parts store and buy them, which I did, uh, because you know I don't always have patience. I did find that they fit as well as the ones that I ordered from Top Flight. The Top Flight ones fit better, um, and like the dry, the uh, instrument panel itself. If I needed service on that, you know, I mean, just. Save yourself a lot of time and aggravation and just go to Beatty. They know what they're doing. The guy that I bought the car from had that instrument panel serviced by, uh, I believe it's Beatty, pronounced Beatty. Those are the guys to talk to. They know what they're doing. You can get the telltale bulbs from them too. Uh, they're just these little bulbs that go in and twist. But anyways, the blower motor, uh, the blower motor is not very hard. It's on the passenger side over here. You got to take a couple bolts out of the wheel well. It's nothing you can't figure out. The whole job took me maybe 45 minutes. I'll, I'll put some pictures in there. Uh, I picked up the flight, the part from Top Flight Automotive Center here. I would say that it increased the airflow in the car by 40%. Um, I wish that I had my anemometer. You know, uh, I use one at work sometimes for, for, for things that I've, I'm, I do at work. And I, I wish that I, I have one now, but the job's already done. I got to get a hold of another car and, and put it in there and test it. Mine's only got it. The other car only has 8,500 miles. So I don't think that one counts. I got to get to a car with like a hundred thousand miles and, and test the airflow. But I can tell you that after replacing the blower motor, the airflow was a lot better. Um, so like on date night when it's 90 degrees in the summertime, my wife was much happier or when you get in the car and full uniform at the end of the day and it's 100 degrees outside and you put the air conditioning on, the airflow, much better. Uh, you know, Not everything I did to the car was required and I'm only mentioning this because when I show you the price at the end, I, you might be a little surprised. Um, I spent quite a bit on this car in two years, um, but a lot, some of the stuff I did was not required. I put an equalizer on the radio that isn't even hooked up. Uh, I put a mobile one plaque in there, I, you know, I bought that. Um, I bought another set of wheels for it just because I had the opportunity to get 85 Z51 wheels that I had never had weights on them. And so I had to take that opportunity. The wheels only had 10,000 miles on them. The wheels that were on the car had weights on them. They just were not in very good condition and I couldn't pass up an opportunity to buy a set of wheels. So when you see the number at the end of this video and how much this cost, keep in mind, not everything I bought, I really needed um, throttle body plate on the throttle body. Yeah, I, I didn't need that. And it looks cool. It was like 10 bucks. Yeah. Uh, another issue that I looked into when I had the wandering throttle uh, was the throttle position sensor. And that is on the right side of the throttle body. And when I put a uh, meter on it, it was not at the neutral position where it should be. And so now I, I don't a hundred percent know whether it was the idle air control valve or it was the throttle position sensor. Um, when I moved the throttle position sensor with a meter connected to it, it was, it was glitchy. It wasn't smooth. So I replaced it with a new throttle position sensor. And now that one works perfectly. That procedure is very simple. You hook a meter to it, uh, you know, you get it in the right settings and it's got to be at point, 0.54 volts, I believe, uh, to in the neutral position. It was off and it might have had a, to do with my throttle wandering. So if your throttle's wandering, idle air control valve and make sure that your throttle position sensor is A, working correctly as you move up and down the throttle range and B is set correctly for your neutral position. If it's not, if either one of those things are wrong with it, you're gonna get a wandering idle. So 
check out your throttle position sensor and I might even check that out first before I did the idle air control valve. I should have done it, but again, you live and you learn. So oh, let's talk about brake fluid. <laughs> so the brake fluid is clear and it's pretty, it's pretty thin. It's, it's not as thin as water, but it's pretty thin, maybe a little bit thick uh, and it's relatively clear. The brake fluid in this car looked like pudding, okay? 100% check your brake fluid, especially on these old C4s. I know for a fact that this car had been to mechanics and that, um, you know, previous owners had done a decent amount of maintenance to it. The brake fluid looked like pudding, as did the clutch fluid. The clutch fluid was worse. The clutch fluid looked like pudding. The brake, uh, so the clutch fluid is brake fluid. Uh, the brake fluid was just black, as black as night, and it was still thin. It was as thin as water. Um, and I found that the brake pedal had a little shimmy, and it didn't give you that firm feeling. Um, so I wasn't satisfied with replacing the reservoir. I went ahead and I did a full brake fluid uh, caliper drain on all four wheels, and I noticed that the brakes felt better after that. I replaced the brake fluid. Even after doing the drain system drain at all four, about a month later when I checked the reservoir, it wasn't perfect. It was still murky. And I replaced the reservoir fluid about three or four times. And now I'm happy with it. It's very good. There's a tester out there that is like literally $10 um, where you just stick it in there, you hit the button. And what you're looking for is water content, right? Your brake fluid should have no water in it. And if it has water in it, then it can corrode your system from the inside out. Not good. So you just put this little $10 sensor in there, you hit the button and it gives you an answer. You know, if you're, if your fluid's at 2% golden, if it's like at 3%, it's yellow, you know, don't worry about it. You can still run the car, but keep it on your radar. 4% and above is considered not good. This fluid, I don't even know what it was. I have a digital tester now, which will actually tell me what it is. This one was probably like 80% water. Like it was not good. It was black as night. The clutch fluid was even worse. I mean, it was like pudding. It was disgusting. So uh, the clutch fluid, I wasn't up on how to drain the clutch fluid 100%. So I just changed the reservoir fluid like 27 times. It's probably not the way to go. I should have done the research and just drained the whole system. But I, I, I was doing other things working on the car and I just kept, replacing the fluid in the clutch reservoir and it's pretty good now i mean it's uh it's a lot better than it was it's pretty clear now um you can do that you can go that route it's just going to take you more time and more effort um i did get a check engine light uh and again i was glad i had my tester i put it in there and it looked like the oxygen sensor was was not good i replaced the oxygen sensor and it was the oxygen sensor so again uh you know having this car uh, it was very handy to have that tester and uh, I, I, I threw a check engine light. I put the tester on it, indicated the uh, O2 and uh, I changed the oxygen sensor and off to the races. It was, that was a pretty simple one. I replaced the battery. Uh, the correct way to replace the battery is this door right here. Okay, you got a 10 millimeter bolt here. You got a bolt in the back and you got a bolt in the front. And then there's a bolt down here in the bottom in between the two panels, okay? This bolt down here should not be removed. This bolt should only be loosened. And at the bottom of this panel is a slide piece. So you just want to loosen this bolt enough to slide out. Then the panel kind of pitches down and it gives you enough room to pull the battery out. Now, I mean, I, I heard guys pulling the cruise control <laughs> unit out to change the battery. I don't, some of them think like that's the way to go. I don't know. I, I've changed about five batteries on these cars. I think that this is pretty easy. It's not that difficult if you know what to do. Bolt in the front, bolt in the back. Oh, there is a couple wheel well bolts you pull out. And then you just got to hit this bolt that's right in between the two panels. That one's a little tricky to find. I'll clip some pictures in. Uh, the wheel center caps, again, probably really something I didn't really need to do. But over time, these center caps had faded. And, you know, again, if you're trying to make the car look good, you're, you, you know, I'm driving the car every day. I'm parking it in parking lot next to brand new cars. Um, you know, and I want it to blend, I want it to look good. And so, uh, I replaced the center caps again, top flight automotive makes it so easy. You just go in there and type in 1985 center caps and boom, they come up in my face. 
I couldn't resist. It's, it's not my fault. It's an addiction. Air dams. Okay, so this was something. Um, I did some, some shots of the car uh, down by the river uh, at the marina, and I thought the shots looked good, but um, I, I posted them. I got a lot of comments. You know, a lot of that looks like a calendar shot and everything else, but the one thing that stood out was the air dams. The air dams did not look good. And so, again, it was a prototype flight. I don't know, 1985 Corvette. Type in air dams. They give you a whole package. But some stuff to know on the air dams, okay? First of all, just buy all three, right? Don't buy them individually. Just buy all three. Uh, and buy the hardware kit. Okay, the replacement air dams were slightly thicker in the plastic than the factory air dams. And the factory hardware was not only older, but it wasn't, I mean, it, it was a pain in the butt. You know, I ordered one and I wound up going to the hardware store and buying longer bolts to go in there. And then I realized why they make a hardware kit for this. And so then I ordered the center and the other side and I try to bite off as much as I can chew. When I don't know what I'm doing, I just buy one piece, take it slow. And remember, I'm driving the car every day. Um, and I did the one, the one air dam. And like I said, sure enough, I wound up running to the hardware store and trading my own hardware kit. So then when I did the other two pieces, I realized why there's a hardware kit that they make for this. And again, this is another reason why it's good to deal with a Corvette you know, specific or Corvette, um, you know, a, a, a parts business that caters to Corvettes because they are aware of this stuff and they sell this kit. So I bought the hardware kit when I had the center and the right side air vents. Um, and I, you know, it made them so much quicker and so much easier. I installed the other ones like in literally a half hour. And this one took me like, three hours because I had to run to the hardware store and into bolts and I came back and I, you know, the car was on stands and it was like, my advice to you is just buy all three pieces and, and buy the hardware kit with it and your life will be much easier. So let's talk quick about the taillights, believe it or not. Taillights, seriously, you're talking about taillights? Uh, well, yeah, taillight goes out on the car. Now we like to take the car out, we like to have fun. And I have to tell you, just as a side note, I mean, it draws attention. People seem to like the car. They think it's cool. You know, it's an 80s car. It's out running around. It looks great. I mean, people say, oh, man, what's that car? 10,000 miles on it. I have some stickers on the car that are period correct, like Gremlins, MTV, um, some political stickers. And it's really, really is a conversation piece when we go out. Um, and, you know, knock on wood, I've had four of these and I really find that I don't get bothered out driving around. I, I, I law enforcement you know, maybe, maybe it's the way I drive. I don't drive crazy. I'll tell you that right now. I'm not out there pushing the car, but I have never been bothered with the four of them that I've had. Um, and the car, like I said, it, it, it's a conversation piece. I feel like every time we take this car out, there's a conversation that night about MTV, about Gremlins, about our favorite 80s movie, you know, which is kind of fun. It's part of the fun of having a car like, um, but I had a taillight out and that'll get you pulled over. A taillight tail out, you know what I mean, will get you pulled over. I mean, that's low hanging fruit. Now you would think, I mean, oh, it's taillight, what's the big deal? Well, these taillights are different. Because 85s don't have a third brake light, your taillight has two elements, okay? So there is an orientation for that bulb and the way that it goes in. And if you put the bulb in backwards, what happens is there's a running brightness and there's a turn signal brightness and the running brightness is dimmer, right? So if you put the ball in bulb in backwards, which can be done, then your one bulb and I'll clip and I'll throw this picture up, you know, that far left bulb there is brighter than the rest of the bulbs because that bulb is in backwards. Now, when that happened to me, I went back to the auto parts place and, you know, I'm not familiar with cars that old either. And I asked some questions like, Hey, how come this bulb is different? And you know, their answer was immediately like, Oh, well, you got to replace the other three. And no, it's perfectly normal. There's no difference in the bulbs. Nobody that worked there knew the right answer, which was there is a difference. I mean, I'm talking, they asked everybody in the store and then the manager came out and was like, yeah, there's no difference in bulbs. You can put them in either way. 100% wrong. There is a difference in bulbs on an 85 Corvette. There is an orientation. Now, there's two ways to change the bulbs. I won't say there's a right way and a wrong way, but there's two ways. There's a bolt that goes into the rear bumper, and you can take that bolt out, and you can 
stick your arm up in there and in the blind, hit the release bolts, turn the fixture and take it down. Uh, if you have anything other than a Great Depression arm, it's going to come out looking like a Wolverine attacked it. Um, now, in my opinion, it's kind of an embrace the suck kind of thing. You got to get the taillight changed. If you do it that way, it takes like five minutes. <sighs> the other option, which I don't have the patience for currently, is you take out the bulb next to the license plate and you reach up in there in the blind and you take the two bolts out to take the taillight out and then you change it that way and then you got to put it back in and you got to put the bolts back in in the blind not for me i, I didn't want to do it that way uh, if you take the bolt out of the back bumper and reach your arm up in there yeah you get a little scratches now maybe it would have been smarter if i put on a long sleeve shirt or maybe a long glove that i could have reached up and protected my hand but whatever it is what it is i went with embrace the sock i took the bolt out and i stuck my arm up in there and had to find the release snaps to release the fixture, turn it, pop it out, bring it down. And again, remember when you take it out, pay attention to the orient orientation of the bulb. And what I would do, what I recommend to you is turn the light bulbs on while that little fixture is hanging down and the light is in it and make sure that it's the same brightness as the rest of them. If it's not, then you put it in backwards. And it's a lot easier to figure that out with the light bulb hanging by your back bumper then after you put it back in the car like I did, and then I had to reach up in there again, scratch my whole arm up. So then I had to go through it twice, you know. I remember I'm at work. It's like, they're like, is everything okay at home? <laughs> my arm looked like I got attacked by a Wolverine after doing it twice. But anyways, it's pretty funny. Um, but in all seriousness, uh, yeah, th that's the taillight deal. The, don't expect the local people to know what they're talking about at the parts store. There is an orientation to that bulb. Um, if you're going to reach up and take it down, even if you do the taillight take up, make sure it's the equal brightness of the other ones before you put everything back together. Save yourself some trouble. Power antenna. Oh, this is an ugly topic. This is an ugly topic. Okay. So the antenna was broke when I got the car. It was all the way up. Um, I replaced it. It worked. Uh, life is good for a month. Uh, and then it stopped working again. And so then I said, well, you know, maybe I got a bad one. Things happen. And so I ordered another one. I took that one out and I put the other one in. Now, it's important to recognize there's a difference in antennas from 1984 to 1987. In 1988, they changed the antenna, probably because the one from 84 to 87 stinks. But that's just my opinion and, and I could be completely wrong. Um, in the 88 and up one, there's like a cover over it. It's entirely different. You can replace the mast separately. And I've seen that done and heard about that. I thought I could do that with mine. That's not a thing from 84 to 87. And the antenna breaks, you just have to replace it. Okay. And I, I don't want to go all through the job, but um, it, to remove the antenna, you reach up from underneath and you unscrew this like coppler fitting. And then you take two bolts out. What size are they? Take a wild guess. Yeah, of course, 10 millimeter bolts. Uh, but these ones have screws poking through them quite a bit. So you need a long 10 millimeter socket. Um, and then you could pull the antenna out and then putting the new one in is relatively easy to switch the wires around. What I do want to pass along to you guys is if your antenna breaks, like what happened with my other car, when I went to look at that car, 8,500 miles, and when I went to look at the car, we turned it on. I turned the radio on, the antenna got halfway up, and it broke, right? And it's, you know, it's the ribbon inside. And the guy was like, I can't believe it. This car, I kept this car perfect, and the antenna broke when he came to look at it. Um, so if your antenna goes out, it, like it did on my other car, it got like halfway up, and it, and it stopped. And it was continuing to run and 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 run. So what you really want to do, if this is the boat that you're in, and you got places to be and things to do, you're daily driving your car, and now this antenna is running, could A, start on fire, B, drain your battery, okay? What you want to do is go over to the passenger side, open the door, pull the fuse panel block, and pull the fuse for the radio and the antenna will stop running. And, and that's what you want to do. That's the immediate short-term fix. The long-term fix, which I used, uh, well, the long-term temporary fix is take off the panel in the back of the car, and I'll clip in some pictures here. It just takes a couple of screws, and then that, that little slide piece that holds the target top on just pulls off, okay? That's all you do to take that off is just pull it straight up, and it comes off. 
that panel will come off. And what you want to do is just unplug the antenna from the relay. Okay. Now you can put that plastic piece back on and put your fuse back in and you can use your radio and you can use your antenna and the power function will just be disabled. Okay. So that's what you want to do with your power antenna. If it goes out on you and the motor's running, you don't want it to run and run, deplete the battery. That's it. Short term, short term fix, pull the radio fuse. Long term, short term fix is disconnect the antenna from the relay, which is under the panel in the back window. Okay. That, 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 that will take 10, 15 minutes with a Phillips head screwdriver. It's a very easy job. Maybe take a little piece of cloth and put it under the plastic piece and pop it up. Uh, very easy to do that. Um, removing the antenna again, the real secret is that you can't remove, you can't replace just the mast. Nothing can be done from the top. You have to reach up from the bottom, turn the coppler piece and the antenna will come out. Of course, with the two 10, 10 millimeter bolts. And I think that's all I got to say about that. Uh, that brings us to the headlight. Okay. And so unfortunately I believe that I caused this headlight issue. And what happened was, one of the coolant leaks was the overflow tank. And when in the hottest day of the summer, I stop at the gas station and fill the car up with gas and I go inside and I get a cup of coffee and I come out and there's fluid leaking from the front of the car and it's the coolant. And this is one of those other coolant leaks that, you know, the previous owner was honest enough to tell me about. Now I thought that the neck of the tank was cracked because you couldn't really see behind it. It was so close to the wall. Um, and the worm clamp and the rubber hose were over this, the, the input tube of the overflow tank. So I ordered another tank, which is okay. I mean, the old tank was dirty and it was full of stuff and it looked terrible. And you had the hood up. It was the worst looking thing under there. Um, when I got the new tank in and I went to take the old tank out, it turns out that behind where you couldn't see the hose had snuck up behind the worm clamp and the fluid was coming out right there. So what would happen with this car is it would get to absolute top temperature. When the fluid went into the overflow tank, it would go out and drip onto the ground and leak out. So the car only had enough fluid in it for absolute maximum temperature. It would always get there pretty quickly. Um, I replaced the overflow tank and I reset the coolant levels, which by the way, my recommendation is the easiest way I found to set the fuel, uh, to set the coolant levels on an old C4 is with this pressure release cap. Okay. Put the pressure release cap on, run the car all the way up to full temperature, release the pressure with the, with the pressure release, and then take the cap off. And if it needs fluid, it will drop and then fill the radiator all the way up and then put the cap back on and lock it and then open up the overflow tank and fill it up to um, hot because the engine is full operating temperature at that point. And that's how I set the fluid level in this car. I've done it a couple of times because like when you change the engine coolant temperature sensor, you're going to lose some fluid. That's the easiest way to do it. Use the high pressure release cap. That's the easiest way to set the coolant level. Um, when I put the overflow tank back in, I put the little retainer ring that holds the hose on the wrong screw. The headlight got halfway over and it hit it. Um, for, you know, and of course we're out that night. And so then I had to just put the headlight down. What I did was I disconnected the gray and these on the, the early cars, you had a motor connector and you have a light connector and I had to just connect, disconnect the motor connector and I had to just drive with one headlight for the night. There was no other way around that one. So then the next day after work, I got it in the garage and I moved the clamp from one side to the other. I reconnected the motor and sure enough, the light went up and down. Everything was back to normal. But about three months later, we took the car out. I go to put the headlight up. It gets about halfway over and it starts ticking. And I'm like, uh-oh. So I push the light in. The light closes all the way. And we were at the restaurant. It, you know, it was dark and we were at the restaurant. So I'm like, okay, whatever. We're good to go. I turn the car off and I, st we start walking inside and I hear, boom, boom. and so like every 10 seconds, that light would go, boom, boom. it was like the, the gear was, was stripped. It was partially stripped from what, you know what I mean? From me hitting it on that clamp. 
So if this happens to you, what you should do is disconnect your gray connector under the hood. So what I did was I turned the headlights on. First time it didn't come all the way up. I turned them off, turned them back on, the headlights came all the way up. I opened the hood and I disconnected both of the gray connectors. And so now the lights are permanently up, okay? And I, I, I went out on a limb and ventured that it was the gear strip from hitting it, the thing. I, now the headlights are fixed up and I drive the car that way for about a week and I ordered the replacement gears. Now the replacement gears came in. Now, I, I didn't even watch a video. I just dove into it, like, which I don't recommend. I don't recommend it, okay? I, I just took that headlight on. I've never worked on one of those before. I've never had that problem before. This is my third C4, and I didn't have the problem with the other one. Um, I just dove into it. Those headlight fixtures, I think, are incredible. I think they're awesome. They're built very well. They're built pretty friendly. There is a difference between early C4s, mids, and lates, okay? And there's um, especially the early, no dial pins in the earlies, two connectors in the earlies. In the mids, you have a change in construction. You have a change in manual turn wheel and you have two connectors. And then in the lates, you've got that same construction change and you only have one connector for all the wires, which kind of stinks because if you have the motor problem like I did, you can't just put them up and disconnect the motor and still use your headlights. But that's the way the lates are made. Um, but anyways, I dug in there and again, this is where the 85, uh, forum came to the rescue. When I got the headlight all taken apart, I, I was a little like, wow, this is more parts than I anticipated. <laughs> I posted a little picture and, um, I posted a little picture and, uh, one of the gentlemen, Matthew Sidoni from the 85 Corvette group, uh, messaged me and said, Hey, I did the same thing. Message me if you have any questions. And it turns out that. You know, when I put it back together, I was like, I took it apart a little fast and I had some questions, which is great. I got a hold of him and, you know, there was one piece that I may have put in the wrong place. I took it back apart and I fixed it. And again, I have no experience with this headlight. Um, but I mean, I do, I build RC helicopters. So gears and fixtures and taking things apart and putting them together is kind of, you know, part of what I've done for a long time. So, I was able to take it out and, and, and get the gears out of it and put the new gears in. One thing Matthew passed along to me was that if the second gear, the black gear, there's a, there's a white gear and a black gear. If the black gear is not damaged, don't replace it, just keep it in there. The, the larger gear, you can see where the worm, uh, the pinion, pinion worm gear ate into the large wheel. That one I replaced. Uh, you want white lithium grease, grease everything back up, and then you want silicone to silicone shut that case. Uh, put the light back together, no problem, and the light works like new. Uh, if you have a C4 Corvette, you may never have to do that job. Uh, this is the first time. But if you have to do it, don't fret. Figure out which year you got. If it's an early car, um, I can tell you they're easier. I've, I have watched a video on the later cars and they seem a little more complicated, but still very doable. Um, it's not a problem. These fixtures, again, I, I think they're, they're like super cool. Like one of the most unique features of the car is these headlights. And I, you know, I, like pulling the car in somewhere every once in a while, it's like, uh, I'll catch like a little kid. We'll see it and be like, Oh my God. And they're looking at it and I'll pull that button and the headlights will flip over, you know, like, Oh my God, you know, did you see that? You know, and it's just like, I love the car. I enjoy driving it. Um, I think the headlights are cool. Uh, this particular car the, has the L98 engine. It's not as high performance as other engines like the ZR1, the LT5 or the Callaway, but it's super reliable. Uh, as reliable as any engine could be old school 350. It's got a distributor. It's not rocket science. So, uh, the last thing I want to mention here that I had done to the car, and this is just specific, sorry, I'm mostly only mentioning it because it inflate the price a little bit was I had the two panels on the car that were not in such great shape. And I, my theory is it was in a garage with a window and the sun kept hitting those spots every single day, the top of the driver door and the roof bar just were, they were all faded and it was weird because the rest of the paint on the car looked pretty good. Um, but for whatever reason, uh, the, 
uh, roof bar and the top of the door didn't look good. I took the car to a, uh, the best paint shop in the area and I had those panels repainted and it, you know, I but um, they repainted it. It looks great. Again, I'm parking this thing with brand new cars. And to me, it just gave off that old look, the faded paint and everything. So all those fixes, all those things added up together. Um, some other random things, uh, fan speed control knob broke. I had to replace that, which surprisingly was like $20. Um, the valve covers, I want to talk real briefly about the valve covers. So 1985 was the first year of eight cylinder fuel injection and the fuel injector connectors are different. The clamp that holds them on goes all the way around the injector and the way to remove the fuel injector connector is to have access from the other side, which means you have to take the whole top of the intake off to really properly take the fuel injector connectors off. In the meantime, the fuel injector connectors have a very short wire that leads to a wiring harness, which is right in with the crankcase pressure line, okay? 85 Corvettes have cast iron heads. Their side bolt, uh, their, their, their side bolt valve covers. In 1986, it was a split year. Early 86s had side bolt valve covers. Late 86s had center bolt valve covers. Because this is uh, 1985, you have the side bolts. When you add all of those factors up together, you got a recipe for a headache, okay? You have to get to these side bolts, but you can't take the fuel injector connectors off without breaking them. And that's why half of them in there are already broken. And so I didn't want to take the other half off. There's zip ties on them. Um, the valve covers had been done once before. They were leaking oil. Um, so what I, I managed to do was, um, I got them off by bending that pipe a little bit and then I can get my ratchet in there. I got the valve covers off and I got the opportunity. I found 1985 valve covers from an 85 Corvette that had been refinished and I bought them and I put them on this car and getting the valve covers on wasn't so bad, but that's where things went wrong. Remember I told you I had to bend that uh, crankcase pressure line to get the valve cover off. Well, when I went to put it back on and re-bend it, those attachment points broke. They broke, right? Now, if the fuel injector connectors were the style that they came out with, and I don't know whether it was an 86 or 87 or 88, they changed the fuel injector connector. And the the pin that holds it on is accessible from that. So you just pull the pin off and then you could pull the fuel injector connector off and then you could get that harness out of the way and getting to that valve cover would be very easy. But in 1985, that didn't exist. The fuel injector connectors are these weird box style, right? And so I had to bend that pipe to get around the, that wiring harness because I couldn't get the fuel injector connectors off and I didn't want to risk breaking those clips. So it was a bit of a headache. Um, and when I went to reconnect those clips, which go under the valve cover bolts, and I bent it a little bit, they broke off of that crankcase bar. Now, I didn't want to just leave that tube open. So I had to get JB Weld, and I got some little metal pieces, and I closed the hole, and I had to JB Weld it. It was a pain. This is a 1985 Corvette thing and maybe early 85 and early 86 thing. So uh, most people don't have to worry about this. In 87, once I went to the center valve covers, you don't, you don't have, won't have that problem. Um, but it's something to be aware of if you have an 85. All right. So the grand finale after replacing all those things, and I have to say this car is now like, this car sat in the garage for a month and I came out and connected the battery and boom, it fired right up. Um, the steering, the steering feels good. The tires are nice. I love this car. If, if I was, if the opportunity came up tomorrow, I would get in this car and drive to California. Um, the opportunity did come up a couple of months ago and I got in this car and drove to Kentucky without thinking twice. 
Um, I didn't have any problems in the car with the car other than one little clip for my uh, my uh, spark plug wires came uh, ha wasn't there there and I had a zip tie on it and it came loose. Simple fix that I fixed. The car performed wonderfully. I wouldn't hesitate to get in this car and drive to California. Um, it, it's been a great car, but all of it has come at a little bit of a price. That is what it cost me to get the car to where it is now. $9,741 is what all of those things cost. That's new tires. Uh, that's the stereo. That's all the stuff. So basically, I'm in the car for $19,000, and the NADA is probably sitting at like about seventeen or seventy-five. dollars well, Cars have dipped a little bit. It might be down a little bit. So I'm probably upside down in the car a little bit. I don't care. I love the car. It's been great. I've got a lot of miles out of it, and that's another factor. With all that stuff done, with all the updates that have been done to the car, if I sold it, I could probably get near top dollar for it, and I got two years of driving out of it. Um, and that was something I noticed like with my 93, uh, my 93 car, I, I bought for like $14,000. I drove it for three summers and I sold it for, I think 13. Um, so, and that is something with C4 Corvettes, they retain their value really big. And I think there's an argument to be made that for the money, you can't get a better sports car. And I know that that's a bold statement, but uh, for the money, you know, and, and when they start talking about beating this car and cars that outperform it, you're immediately talking about 30, 40, $50,000 cars. What does that tell you? Um, and some of those things like the F 16 feel of the car, the theme of the car, a lot of the things that are in this car are just not replaceable. And if you're in touch with that stuff, you know what I mean? If these were the cars that were popular when you were younger, um, you know, it, it's irreplaceable. Uh, so, I love the car. Just to take a quick step back, so why the red car? Why? What was the point of the red car? So the point with the red car is that I haven't really touched that red car yet. Uh, I haven't done anything with the red car yet. Um, I'll be doing a lot of work on it in the upcoming videos. This car is pretty much done. I'm driving it. Uh, there should be a lot of videos coming up this year where I'm doing all the stuff that I need to do to go from barn find to daily driver in order to get uh, on, on that red car, because that car sat for 12 years as well. Hey, this is Kevin coming at you from the editing booth. Hey, just wanted to take a second and say that uh, if you're still watching, you are officially a C4 connoisseur, uh, and I can't thank you enough. Looks like this project is going to come in at about an hour and 57 minutes. Um, my goal for these videos is to be less than 10 minutes and to just cover tools that are needed, what parts I bought, what you need to do, things to look out for. Uh, but this one ran a little long. Obviously, we were covering a lot. Thank you so much for sticking around. I really do appreciate it. So stay tuned. Thanks for checking out the channel, and we'll see you next time on Kevin's Garage.